Ladies and gentlemen, if I may have your attention, please. give me odds yesterday that I'd have made it to Phoenix this morning, I don't think I'd have taken the bet, especially since I missed the last commercial flight out of St. Louis. But here I am. That's me on the right. The guy on the left, that's my partner, Fred Miller. When I called Fred from St. Louis, he was already waiting for me in Phoenix. Now, this particular cattle sale was important to both of us. We needed the best breeding stock available. And it was right here on John Wayne's 26 Bar Ranch, just outside of Phoenix. And this sale was a once a year thing. But I made it with time to spare, thanks to the night flying know-how of a charter pilot on an interesting dusk to dawn flight. I'm kind of glad I missed the commercial flight from Phoenix. This trip will give me the chance I've been looking for. Now, that's Dave Hastings, my pilot. We seem to hit it off right from the start. That comes on mighty fast, doesn't it? Yeah, it sure does. Pretty to look at. A little different to fly in, though. You sound like my flight instructor. You know, that's one of the reasons I'm looking forward to this trip, Dave. I want to learn more about night flying. Where have you done most of your flying, Jim? All around Nashville, all VFR fair weather flying. A couple free takeoffs and landings at night. This was my chance to get a lot of questions answered so I'd feel better qualified to fly cross country on my own. If you know what you're doing, flying at night can be very enjoyable. For one thing, the air is usually smoother at night. I'm aware of that. I noticed there's not so much turbulence now. And there's fewer pilots using the airspace, so of course there's a lot less traffic. However, you still have to be aware of other aircraft. Here, for example, look over there about 2 o'clock. You see that little aircraft right below us down there? Yeah. We're going to lose him right into the lights of that little town there. Okay. I see what you mean. This blackness that we're flying in can pose problems for you that you're never going to come across in the daytime. However, there are techniques that are known today about night flying. And by intelligently using these techniques, night flying can be safer and even more enjoyable for any pilot that, you know, wants to take the trouble to learn. I got nothing better to do for the next seven hours, Dave. I'm ready, willing, and able. Good. Glad to hear it. Make the trip more interesting for me. Okay. I filled Dave in on what I had already learned in ground school. As long as we have our vision, we can fly an airplane with practically no instruments. But when we talk about vision, we're speaking of two types, both the day and the night. Our color vision is greatly curtailed, particularly at night, without a sufficient oxygen supply. As the flight continued to our first stop, Oklahoma City, I thought I spotted something. The plane over there at 2 o'clock. Where well, I don't see it. Right there. That's just a reflect, then. And that's exactly what it was. A reflection from our instruments. At night, you lose a lot of visual cues that you count on in the daytime. Unless there's plenty of light on the ground, you don't have a good horizon to judge your attitude by. You can't see trees or buildings to judge altitude or height above the obstacle reflexes that cue responses in daytime flying 
are frequently missing at night. Now, if you've become too engrossed with duties in the cockpit, and then look up, you may experience spatial disorientation or even vertigo. To cope with this problem, always check your flight instruments before glancing out of the cockpit. And when glancing down, always check the flight instruments again to make sure of the airplane's attitude. Now, if you have prolonged cockpit tasks, break them up with an occasional glance at your flight instruments. Another thing, whenever darkness descends, keep track of aircraft attitude continually. Always avoid sudden or abrupt attitude changes. They only increase the likelihood of disorientation. Now, if you become unsure of the attitude of your aircraft, go to your flight instruments. Stay with them until you're again sure you have the attitude that you want. Hey, it looks like it pays to know how to use your instruments, even if you're not IFR rated. That's very true. There'd be a lot fewer night flying accidents if more BFR pilots knew how to use the instruments they've got more effectively. Once you've established a straight flight path, either by using your instruments or by using outside references, carefully note the position of the prominent stars on the windshield. Uh, you can maintain a pretty straight flight path simply by keeping the stars in the same place. Then you can scan for other aircraft or enjoy the sights on the ground or whatever. Oklahoma City, coming up. Wiley Post Tower. Commander 9094 November, 6 Northeast landing, over. Commander 9094 November, enter left base, runway 17 left. Wind 180 degrees at 10, altimeter 2975, over. Wiley Post Tower, 9094 November, will report left base. Wow, this leg went quick. Now here's another thing, Jim. Avoid the long straight-in approach, unless, of course, you're using precision instrument approach aids. Since you can't see objects on the ground and judge heights, there's a tendency to come in low. But if your speed is right, your power setting quite low, you'll have a fairly steep and safe approach angle. Now, if we had daylight, there'd be reference points here, but of course, we don't have any at night. If you bring it in too low, you'll hit the wire. This landing we're about to make here in Oklahoma City will give you a chance to see the proper attitude to use on landing at night. A good tip to remember is to complete the final turn as you would in daylight, rolling out on final at a familiar height and distance. As at any time, Jim, speed control is very important. But in twin engine aircraft, you always want to make sure that you maintain your best single engine rate of climb speed until landing is assured on your final approach. Slow that down to 1.3 over the fence. This will prevent you from floating down the runway and possibly overshooting the field. Charlie Post Tower, 9094 November, on left base. Commander 904 November, cleared to land, over. 9094 November, Roger. In judging your turn on final approach, use the runway lights as your principal reference to initiate the final turn. Even though you've used your landing checklist, recheck gear down and lock. And after you turn on final, Jim, turn on your landing lights. Then adjust your throttle and attitude as necessary to control your descent and airspeed. Round out, be smooth. Ease off the power till the main gear touches the runway. Then, of course, be sure that your power is off. Tower 9-4 November, we'd like to park at the terminal. Commander 9-4 November, taxi to the ramp, over. 9-4 November.
How about some coffee? Fine, let's go. Here she comes. While the airplane was being refueled, Dave recapped the difference between day and night landing. The daylight. You normally aim your final approach near the end of the runway. Okay. Here is where airspeed control is really important. Because if you exceed normal approach speed, you're going to have problems. You mean... 1.3 times the stall in the landing configuration coming in over the fence. That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. Using excessive speeds can result in your overshooting the entire runway. All right, Dave, now let me ask you this. What should you do if you misjudge your approach? Well, if it doesn't look good, just take it right on around again. Uh, if there's a VASI available, use it to help set up your final approach. In any event, Jim, it's going to pay you to take the time to practice night landings under various conditions. Now, when you're practicing, here, hand me that knife a minute. Now, when you practice, look critically at the perspective created by the runway lights and the approach lights. Now, the thing to do here is mentally photograph and remember this pattern on the approaches that go well. You see? Right. Yeah. As Dave made his pre-flight inspection, I became aware of the fact that it takes longer to inspect the plane. So we'll allow for it. A complete inspection should include a check of all lighting equipment, as well as the regularly inspected items. In the process, you've got to be sure that windows, windshield, and instrument faces are reasonably clean, since maximum light transmission will be required with minimum glare or diffusion. Whenever possible, sit in relative darkness to increase the level of dark adaptation again before takeoff. Wiley Post Ground Control, Commander 9094 November, terminal ramp, taxi for takeoff, over. Commander 9094 November, Taxi to runway 17 left. Wind 170 degrees at 8. Altimeter 2976. Over. 9094 November. Remember to keep alert for ground traffic. The tendency for most pilots is to taxi too fast at night because of reduced visual cues. They're not giving much thought to ground traffic. But there's no telling when a vehicle will pop right up out of the darkness. I asked Dave how he knew which way to taxi with all those colored lights. Blue lights outline the taxi area. Now, in some cases, you're going to run into this new taxiway light. It's a green, flush-mounted centerline type. Commander 904 November, taxi in position and hold, over. 904 November. Well, here we go again, Jim. When you're taking off at night, line up your aircraft in the center of the runway. And don't overlook your flight instrument checks and adjustments. And align your heading indicator to runway heading. Commander 904 November cleared for takeoff. 904 November.
during takeoff, look well down the runway. Use the perspective of the runway lights as guides for directional control. Many pilots use the landing lights during takeoff. Now, at the point of rotation, or soon thereafter, before the last few runway lights pass behind your field of vision, check your instruments for indication of climb attitude. Keep your wings level and hold takeoff attitude and climb airspeed. And you'll be in good shape. Continue a straight climb. Checking the instruments frequently until you've reached a safe altitude, at least four or five hundred feet. Always check outside for other aircraft. Visual references as you maneuver away from the field. You don't have to become instrument rated to fly at night, but it sure does help. As we headed west to Albuquerque, Dave showed me how to use the en route charts to get the minimum instrument en route altitude. He recommended that even though flying VFR, the minimum en route altitude should be observed when flying at night. This definitely assured us terrain clearance. We've got to make a position report to Amarillo. Amarillo Radio, this is Commander 9094 November, 8,500 VFR to Albuquerque, over. Commander 9094 November, this is Amarillo Radio. Roger, Amarillo altimeter 3002. Roger, 9094 November. In less than three hours, we started our approach to Albuquerque. Here I learned another value of minimum en route altitude. With a strong westerly wind blowing on the airport at Albuquerque, Dave knew that there was a good possibility of a Venturi effect in the pass we were flying into. A Venturi effect that could give us an erroneous altimeter reading of as much as 1,500 feet. You see, the wind moving through the restricted area of the pass results in increased velocity, which reduces atmospheric pressure. Now, as an aircraft flies into this area, this reduced pressure produces a false altimeter reading, giving you the impression that you're higher than you really are. Now, if a pilot compensates by descending to maintain the desired indicated altitude, well, he may find he's below the level of the pass. Albuquerque approach control. This is Commander 9094, November 10 East, landing Albuquerque, over. Commander 9094, November, Albuquerque approach. 10 east, make straight and approach runway 26, wind 280 degrees 10, altimeter 284. Contact the tower now on 118.3. Roger, 9094 November. To play it safe, we stayed high. Starting our descent only when the lights of Albuquerque made it obvious, we had plenty of mountain clearance. I had trouble locating the runway lights among all the street lights. We were on final before I spotted them. While they topped off our tanks, we went into the flight service station. Good morning. Yes, I believe so. While Dave got the latest sequence report, I studied the airport layout charts. When operating from an unfamiliar field, pilots should take the trouble to study the airport layout before departing. It'll reduce confusion during taxi to takeoff. Well, it looks like we've got sky cover all the way to Phoenix. What does that mean? No stars, no moon. It's going to be just blacker and black the whole way. <laughs> what about lights on the ground? No, there's not going to be many. We're going to have to rely pretty heavily on instruments. And I can also use the autopilot. Ready? Let's go. On takeoff, we began our climb at a best rate of climb speed. 
This got us to a safe maneuvering altitude as soon as possible. Then, in case of an emergency, we knew we'd be higher than any obstructions en route back to the airport. En route, Dave filled me in on smoking. He said that it tends to cut down on the amount of oxygen a pilot takes in from the atmosphere as he breathes. The lack of oxygen decreases a pilot's visual acuity. Since we were climbing to 12,500 feet, we went on oxygen. This additional oxygen improves a pilot's visual perception and mental alertness. Alcohol also decreases a pilot's ability to see at night, even more so than smoking. We removed our oxygen masks after we passed the mountains and began our descent into Phoenix. I see you reach for things and you don't even look. How can you be sure you've touched the right things? It takes practice. You have to spend time in the cockpit familiarizing yourself with the location and the feel of everything. And then you just perform the same operations blindfolded. Good thing someone else was doing the flying. Without a horizon for a reference, I'd have us in serious trouble. What are you doing? Well, now I'm cross-checking my position along my planned route. Why? Well, we have a problem. So I want to know within a few miles where we are. Can I see the map? It looks like pretty rough terrain down there, eh, Dave? Yeah, right. And airports are few and far between out here. And few, if any of them, are going to have anything like the elaborate lighting setup that we've seen at the major airports we've been landing at so far. What's the name of the airport in Phoenix? Sky Harbor. Phoenix has several other small airports situated around the city. And there are mountains in that area, and you have to be careful that you keep your pattern in close to the airport. Give yourself as much clearance as possible. Now keep these mountains in mind. Those dark areas down there among the lights of Phoenix look like parks, but in daylight you'll find out that they're really mountains. What kind of conditions will we run into at Sky Harbor? There it is, right ahead. I can't find it with all those lights. One way to beat that problem is to fly the radio from the Omni that takes you over the airport. Say another way, Jim, you simply check your chart. Look at the position of the airport in relationship to the rest of the city. That'll give you an idea as to where to look. Thanks to Dave's careful planning and flight preparation, we had a nice, safe night flight. And we made it with plenty of time to spare. Mr. John Williams. And welcome to the 26th bar. We're certainly proud to have you here, and we're proud of our bulls this year, and you kind of tossed the coin for which one you'd want. Well, welcome to the cattle sale. Hi, Mr. Wayne. Well, thank you. Well, I'm Fred Weller. This is Jim Billing. All right. Here's the lot number one by the Lucky Domino F216 out of a Kalob Domino bred cow. The auction is on, and tell me in how many dollar points. I'm on 25,000 on him. I'm 25 to go, give me 10,000 dollars on him. I'm 10,000 dollars, I'm 11,000 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 dollars,